Attention, attention. Uh, hello there, listeners. Uh, it's We Have Ways of Making You Chalk. Another one of our Chalk Valley We Have Ways of Making You Talk crossovers. Um, the Avengers films have nothing on this for sheer crossover power, do they, James? No, absolutely we, not. We've combined our podcast with your history festival and uh, pun carrying all the weight. The load bearing. It's amazing, isn't it? We- it's amazing <laughs> what can be done, what can be achieved. And actually, <laughs> with one word, while I think about it, because I forgot the other day, um, can I just puff the Chalk Valley History Show, which is also going on every night at seven thirty p.m. live, and tonight, Thursday, the twenty fifth of June. The main talk on the show is Adam Rutherford, the brilliant Adam Rutherford, uh, talking about how to argue a racist. You're on as well with your Spitfire wing spa bit, uh, Laura Maitland. Um, and we've got Annette Gordon-Reed uh, from the US and Tom Timbrell, who's doing his Iron Age Forge. So lots going on tonight. So do have a look at that. And you can get that at cvhf.org.uk. And it's on. Uh, there's a link straight through to YouTube Premier at 7.30pm tonight. So that's cvhf.org.uk. cvhf.org.uk um, to see me blather on about a piece of aluminium. I mean, there's other items, obviously. Right, now... But nothing as uh, important as that, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> right, now, listeners. Hello there, everybody. Um, this is... Uh, I've been looking forward to this for ages and t- to getting this chap on to talk to us at some point. Um, uh, we are talking today to uh, Pr- Professor Gary Sheffield from uh, uh, the uh, Department of War Studies at the University of Wolverhampton um, and author of such books as Forgotten Victory, The First World War, Myths and Realities, a, a book that basically... Um, uh, upset all the right people, I think is one of the ways of looking at it. Yeah. Um, um, broke, broke an awful lot of crockery in the in the process. Um, uh, uh, a biography of of, of du- uh, Earl Douglas Haig um, in 2011, um, and uh, someone who has uh, made colossal waves in uh, the the study of the First World War and trying to crack open public attitudes and received opinions on the First World War, but who is now moving his his uh, his sights in our direction, James. Yes, except um, like all super duper eminent academic historians like like Gary, um, their knowledge is wide, and um, and and that's one of the things that always makes talking to people like Gary so interesting because you know you're going to get that broader perspective, that broader spectrum, and you know this being we have ways of making you chalk. Um, we we want to do that big picture stuff, and I've I, and and you know we've just been reading an article that you've sent us, Gary, which is certainly much broader than I um, originally kind of thought about all this stuff. But anyway, it's great to have you on. So thank you for coming. Yes, hello. So hello, Gary. Now, now, hello, hello. Now <laughs> yeah, we want you to, are allowed to one speak. Of the, one by of the, the things way. that comes up. <laughs> yes, yeah. that's good. Yeah, yeah. One of the didn't want to interrupt your flow. <laughs> well, no, we, we we were singing your praises, of course. Um, one of the one of the things that comes up every now and again when 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 people talk about the Second World War and the twentieth century is this idea of a thirty years war, a second thirty years war, um, uh, because it it kind of fits, doesn't it? Um, you know, the, the Thirty Years' War, the, 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 the colossal uh, confrontation of the, of the uh, 17th century that spanned the whole of Europe, uh, uh, vast amounts of people killed, Germany uh, shattered, or the, the German state shattered by it, Sweden overturned, it happened here as well, if you include mm. the English Civil War, um, uh, and, uh, and, and so on. But what do you so? What do you make of this idea of a twentieth century thirties war? Because it's neat. It's neat, isn't it? it well, fits. it is very neat, and in some ways it works really well um, because, from our perspective, it's easy to look back and see. Right, there's this. In effect, uh, the argument is there's there's a European civil war. Yeah, it breaks out in 1914. The first phase of it ends in 1918, and there's a lot of unresolved. Uh, problems and the peace isn't very satisfactory and you know they come back and and start all over again 20 odd years later of course famously um marshall foch the allied sort of supreme commander in 1918 said of the treaty of versailles that uh this isn't a peace it's it's a 20 years armistice and 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 he was pretty well right bear in mind he was speaking in 1919 um and so in some ways it fits really well in other ways it doesn't yeah. I mean, one of the uh, the big things which comes and sort of slaps you between the eyes the moment you start to sort of read round the, the the literature of the last sort of twenty odd years is that actually there's no reason why the Treaty of Versailles shouldn't actually have succeeded. That actually it's not the world's greatest 
uh, peace treaty, but you know which one is. Yep. And actually, yep. if everybody had been prepared to get behind it, it might have worked. By everybody, I really mean the victor powers. You know, the, yeah. the, the Britain, France, the United States in particular. Trouble is, two out of the three of those peeled off really quickly. Uh, the French were keen on um, Im imposing, you know, rather, rather uh, making sure that the Germans stuck to, to the letter of the Treaty of Versailles. But their two sort of erstwhile allies uh, cleared off. So actually, so that, that's the first thing. The second thing is that um, this has almost become orthodoxy over the last, last, last few years. The really big... Uh, breaking point at which war becomes inevitable a second, sec, second time. It's not as far back as, as Versailles in 1919. It's really the Wall Street crash yep. which in 1929, which brings about the Great Depression, which hits Europe with full force in 1931-32. That destroys the already pretty rickety Weimar Republic in Germany, which of course is is, a, is is starts off as a democracy, has a very very difficult birth in, in, in revolution, mm -hmm. but is stabilised by the late twenties and and actually gets really badly hit by this. Yeah, and that produces the circumstances under which Hitler comes to power. Now, anybody who's looked into how Hitler comes to power realises there's nothing preordained about it. In some ways, it's some German conservatives trying to be clever by putting him into power, therefore to, to clip his wings and the rest of it. And of course, Hitler, once in power, uh, once in office, I should say, seizes power. There's yeah. a revolution and you have the Nazi state emerging. But even up to a point, you know, well, revolutions happen left, right and centre, but Hitler is such a one-off, uh, a dedicated um, fanatic, uh, racist and all the rest of it well lots of those around but actually he was determined a war war on, on on a global scale from the very beginning and it's it's easy to imagine that history goes pretty well according to uh, as it did, did did in reality and you have some sort of military figure emerging as a dictator in the early, early 30s and you might get some sort of small-scale border war with Poland in 1939, what you actually got was this vast racial, genocidal, ideological war, and that's Hitler's doing. So, But, Gary, um, I think it's, it's worth pointing out, isn't it, that, that, that you know, I, I think because we live in such interesting times at the moment, you know, the interesting thing about is why is it the Wall Street crash? And it's the Wall Street crash because you have this incredible economic downturn. And what you get when you have incredible economic downturns is you then get political unrest follows, you know, as, as sure as sort of, you know, day follows night. And the old order changeth, don't it, doesn't it? And and suddenly you've got, you know, you, you people people are getting angry and, and they want an outlet for it. And, you know, you, you can see these patterns repeating themselves over and over through history and, and, and not least at the moment. It's, it's really interesting, isn't it? Well, I'm, you could see some of the same things. I'm a bit dubious about sort of extrapolating from a past to present. I am a historian, after all. That's, yeah. that's not the <laughs> sort of thing that gets you criticised on Twitter if you make sort of two, two direct parallels. But you're absolutely right. I mean, the circumstances we're going through now are... It's the patterns. I'm not saying it's the history remarkable. of pieces of it. It's the patterns. Well, it? and what happens is ideas, ideas that have been lurking um, on the fringes um, take on new new impetus, don't they? It's the yeah. thing because people are people are angry. They're looking for answers. They they feel desperate. So so actually, actors that have previously been regarded as ir irrational or not an option, which is exactly what happens in, in in Germany, isn't it? But but as you say, Gary had 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 the nothing's ordained about Hitler's arrival in no. pa in, in, in power because he takes office and then, as you point out, th then takes power because you've had plenty of people in Germany in office who haven't really been in power, which has sort of been the is sort of the gap. Well, there's an election the in July 1932, isn't there? And, you know, he comes yeah. into power in, in January 19... You know, it's six months later, isn't it? At yeah, which, but, uh, which but, point the Nazi vote had actually dropped. Yeah. Yes. From, yeah. From from, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely right. I mean... Um, you see all of these things going on at, at this time, and uh, as well as ideas coming from the margin. Of course, some of them are actually, you know, inverted commas, good ideas. Um, in the US, you know, the, uh, the United States is going through absolute traumatic economic problems in the early 30s, and it throws up a charismatic, radical leader, but it's FDR. 
Yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's, yeah. it's Roosevelt yeah. who actually does come up with some things which would have been regarded as being, you know, completely beyond the pale just a few years before. You know, the whole you know, New Deal and all, all all the rest of it. Um, I know you had Dan Todman on, on 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 a few weeks ago, and he's he's very keen keen on this this, this idea that Britain in, in the thirties. I think is is stable, not least because you've already got a sort of liberal version of Toryism in place. Yeah. Particularly under Baldwin, Chamberlain's a much more divisive Marmite figure, but but Baldwin's the key guy in power at the early stage, and so you know you you don't have the sort of political space for a rabble rousing uh, radical. I mean, Oswald Mosley, you know, is the obvious example who clearly wanted to be. To come to power, France, of course, you have enormous political stability, in, in instability, and what happens is that democracy survives, but the French state, I think, is greatly weak. And of course, 1940 and uh, uh, pay down the National Revolution, or all, all, all that happens. So, all of these things, there's, there's a range of things which happen because of, because of the instability in in the 30s. Back to my original point, it's by no means um, predetermined that the First World War slightly dodgy peace second world war breaks out 20 years later do not pass go do not collect 200 all sorts of things uh, old ajp taylor of course i suspect we're all brought up on on him do you do you think it is i mean there, there's so much upheaval though in the 1930s uh, isn't there you know there's, there's there's piers brenda's dark valley he sort of looks into all this kind of forensically and, you know all these i mean from, from the upheaval in japan to china to you know to political changes of, of you know we, we talk about france but you know huge number of different governments in in france you know very unstable politically at the time you know the the, the economic downturn of 1929 is that also cause is, is that a hangover of 1914 to 18 do you think in versailles or, or is that over again is that overstating it uh well the last thing i would claim to be is an economic historian <laughs> but uh, no it's, it strikes me that what, what what happens of course is the the world economic order is given enormous shock by the first world war and so already there's a good deal of instability in the system in in, in the 20s so in britain of course you know you have you know persistently high unemployment from you know the, the early 20s onwards mm. it, it simply gets worse yeah in in the depression because the general strike so is, when, is three years but the general strike of 1926 is, is three years before ab absolutely um and there's an argument, actually, that the general strike shows the central stability of British society yeah. rather than the opposite. Yeah, yeah. Because the trade union, well, basically, the, most of the trade unions and the government cooperate to keep the lid on everything. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's very different from Germany just, just, just a few years later or, 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 or a few, few years earlier. So, so all, all of these things are, are, are in the mix. So, but it was a very volatile situation. And the Great War really rips everything up and makes everything uh, new. Because certainly when I was, um, you know, when I, when I was at school, when I, I guess when I, when I was a student at university a very long time ago now, there was, there was sort of general assumption that the Second World War was the point at which everything changed. Actually, no. Um, the world the Second World War destroys is barely 30 years old because actually the old order where you have the Habsburg Empire which yeah, has been yeah, there for course. how many hundred years and what have you that's the the stability which is which is which is destroyed yeah. by the first world war so so back to Al's original question for about three hours ago now st st strikes me that the 30 years war thesis actually makes a lot of sense because clearly we're in a really big period of stability which lasts from 1914 arguably a few years before to 1945, definitely a few years after. But as a sort of sake of argument, a 40-year block of instability and crisis, right. of which the two world wars are at the centre of it. But that doesn't mean that the First World War absolutely causes the Second World War, or rather the ending of the First World War doesn't cause the Second World War. A another way out of it is certainly possible. Even be a small-scale war in 1939, but not on the scale of the one we get. But the but is the is the thing that's not remarkable about the twentieth century though is is that and and I'm I, I, I'm you're going to argue with this proposition is that this is the first time population populations are mobilised fully that this is the first 
um, uh, proper, you know, this is how we, again, this is how we see it from here. That, that because because people aren't in touch with what happened in particularly in this country aren't really in touch with what with the European uh, mobilizations and uh, uh, the, the 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 way for instance the Napoleonic Wars were fought in in Europe um that there's this idea that these are the first total wars wars of populations wars of citizens wars of wars of governments and uh, rather than rather than wars of states rather rather, rather than crowns and their um military castes if you will and the, uh, 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 but but that isn't the case is it that the, the the napoleonic war is a citizen state you know the french revolution generates the idea of the citizen soldier the relationship between the soldier the citizen and in fact all the things that in the second world war the british state uses in order to mobilize its population that, that you're a citizen so you're doing your bit to help everyone else out is that right yeah, yeah, I, th- I, th- I, th- I think so. I mean, I mean, like everything in history, um, you get two historians together and you get about forty-five opinions. And to- <laughs> total war is is actually quite controversial. Um, yeah. But I actually think it's it's a really good way of understanding the way that wars operate and and actually how societies cope with wars. Um, I mean. If you regard total war as being, I mean, we mentioned the Thirty Years' War, the 17th century, just killing lots of people. Well, that's happened many times before. Yes. What's different from 1792, the outbreak of the, the Revolutionary Wars, becomes the, then becomes the Napoleonic Wars, is that you get a very deliberate attempt, first of all by the French and then by everybody else, to mobilise populations in a way which they haven't really been able to do before. And I think there's, 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 there's two reasons. The first one is... It's about ideas. Um, that you know, the idea that uh, at the Battle of Valmy, you know, the, the famous example in 1792, when the, uh, the 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 Prussians, you know, the the army which had been of Frederick the the, the Great and was um, sub- still supposedly the greatest ar- army in Europe, gets turned away uh, in, in a, actually a pretty small scale battle at, at Valmy by a bunch of sort of you know ragged French revolutionaries. Um, but why is that? Well. All sorts of reasons, but one of them is that this is mobilising people who are now citizens and not subjects. They are fighting because they have a stake in the state they're yeah. defending, and that that's new. So they've that's, suddenly got they've different. got skin in the game in a way that they haven't before. Yeah. Absolutely, and, 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 and if you accept that you're no longer sort of a, a peasant and a subject of a king, you are a citizen, and therefore you have certain um, privileges. You also have certain responsibilities. The key one of which is to defend the state. But that also, it's, it's also and, presumably it's also morale, and you know, we've we, Alan and I have spent an awful lot of time talking about the importance of morale in the Second World War. But you know, any army, if it's got no morale, it's kind of very difficult to kind of motivate people. And if you're doing it because you're, you know, you've been told to by your king or by your knight or your, you know, you're just a serf, then you know, it's like you've got no skin in it, have you? But if you're suddenly a citizen and you're fighting for sort of a bigger ideal, then you're you're more motivated, aren't you? Motivation is really important. Well, it's, it's absolutely critically important, and. The French score really, really well on this, actually for much of the period we're talking about, right down to 1815, because they they regard themselves as actually having a stake in what they're fighting for. Now, if you're a peasant called up in the, for the Prussian army or the Russian army or the Austrian army, conceivably you haven't actually got that... Well, fact, you, you probably have, have, haven't got that, 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 that sense. Brits, as always, are different, of course, because the British army is a regular professional army, very largely, and they might not have a state in a stake in in the system, but actually they're well disciplined and all, 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 all the rest of it. One of the big differences, though, of course, is that as the the Napoleonic Wars wear on, the other side catch on to the importance of nationalism. So the Prussians in 1813, the Russians in 1812, the Spanish fighting the Duke uh, alongside the Duke of Wellington against the French in the, in, in the peninsula. And of course, today is the 205th anniversary. Is that right of Waterloo? So and to, and to go speech. Yeah, I noticed that the Waterloo wasn't mentioned on the BBC News today when Macron <laughs> came over. Oddly, uh, but the Spanish, of course, make a really big thing of you know you're fighting for for king and and country. And religion, it's a different form of nationalism from the French nationalism, but it's really, really potent. And, of course, you get that in spades. If I just finish the, the point, because I think it ties in really neat to what you said about, about the Second World War. The other big difference is that in the late 18th century, so 1790s onwards, the state is an ability to, to do something about channelling this nationalism in a way it really hasn't before and this becomes even more potent as the 19th century wears on 
and of course into the 20th century. So by the time of the First World War, you actually have nationalism pretty well in all countries, including, you know, uh, um, the Habsburg Empire. And we're able to tap into that because you've got conscription, which is pretty rigorous re reinforced. Not least because actually, if you want to run away and hide in your granny's tool shed, you know, in 1800, you probably can. It's much more difficult to do that because the grip of the state has increased 100 years later. It's also probably, you know, seen as being a real social downer if you're if you're uh, a column dodger, draft dodger, 100 years later where it wasn't before. Even more so in the First World War even more so in the Second World War. And, of course, um, I'm not sure whether you've had uh, Johnny Fenelon to talk about his brilliant book, The People's... Uh, Fight, Fighting the People's War. And this comes out in spades. Motivation, citizenship, and all the rest of it for the British and Dominion armies and the Indian army in, in, in the Second World War. Because this is, this is the, one of the interesting things, isn't it, about the 19th century, is that nationalism is, a, nationalism is really a product of the French Revolution. Is it, and, and for a long, a long time during the 19th century, it's essentially a progressive idea. It's a new idea because it's, because it's getting rid of the idea of kings and subjects and repositioning the citizen um, and, and inventing the state. And so, so in the 19th, so then, then when Nazism come along, Hitlerism, but basically taking those clothes, it's quite, it's, it's, a, it's one of these, you know, snakes and ladders of history thing that, that nationalism, which comes from a revolutionary place, you know, from uh, arguably from the left, ends up in the hands of, of people that, people certainly on the right. And, and, and so nationalism's, nationalism's uh, traverse across the political um you know, uh, uh, spectrum is 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 pretty interesting, and and then the state, you know, the politicians uh, using it and then backing away from it because it's because it's a po such a potent force. It's well, a, it's a fascinating part of its absolutely, progress. Absolutely, because you know, after, at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, the the monarchical powers, the the old regimes who've won, they want to stuff the nationalist genie back in the bottle. Yes. Yeah, and it doesn't so, work, the, does it? It doesn't work at well, all. It, it, does, you, it you, doesn't. You, you, you suddenly get that that movement in Italy, which develops after the Napoleonic Wars, to uh, um, to, to kind of you, you know the the push for unification, kick out the Habsburgs. You know, why do we want yeah. the Habsburgs in Italy? You know, and and that eventually sees its end in in 1861, of course, uh, with the Risorgimento. But but you know, you have the revolutions of of 1848. Um, you know, well, you've got all sorts of stuff going on. You know, and, yeah. and, and, and the, the the message is. You know, we the people want to kind of take back. Take, we want to take back control. <laughs> to <laughs> coin a phrase. We're, we're, we're just on that very thought. We will take a break, <laughs> and we'll be back with Gary Sheffield in a minute because we we need. To, I need to take back control of this podcast. <laughs> See you in a tick. Welcome back to We Have Ways of Making You Chalk. Um, well, <laughs> Sorry about what that. A to just end, what a thought to, to end on. <laughs> well, no, but it's the, 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 this is the thing. This is the interesting thing, and it's it is interesting the way that nationalism has has made its way across the the, the political uh, sp spectrum. I remember I remember um, John Keegan writing about this very interestingly about um, you know uh, Prussian citizenship and rifle clubs in in Germany in in German provinces where people would join up to be riflemen and then and that was how you then and then you did your military service and that way you got the vote right. and that you know and so you could so, so there is there is sort of an argument that in not, you know that when you get universal suffrage after the first world war in this country it's the people of Britain being told thank you for your service well done uh, uh, you, you you turned up when we needed you to as riflemen so now we're going to give you the vote I mean it that's that's not not actually um, I think not far off at what happened really well, it's is it? no it's, it's absolutely right I mean there, there there is a sense that the uh, the working classes are mostly disenfranchised they're actually forming the bulk of the armies yeah. in the first world war therefore they must be rewarded and actually yeah. i think people lost sight of this two years ago when they we, when we were commemorating the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage that actually was in many ways an add-on to giving male male working classes a vote yeah. but actually spooling back a bit before the war um the british dominions particularly new zealand and australia had already brought in um universal suffrage before the war and one of the reasons for that is you know, there's there's this sense that they've proved willing to defend the country and the empire therefore that must be rewarded so there's there's a real sense you know why 
citizen soldier, which actually happens when I'm, when I'm writing them out at the moment, is important out in the Dominions because it shows your, your Brits are bo- broad, uh, you're actually worthy of self-government, and because these places tend to be a bit more democratic than Britain were at that stage, the vote came along early. So, yeah. and again, we forget that you know, the current British political system is barely 100 years old in terms of universal suffrage and all the rest of it. Mm. We're talking about a really recent phenomenon in historical terms. Yeah, which after all, which after all, and again, Jonathan Fennell talks about this and um, other 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 authors like Ben Kite and Brett, uh, Alan Allport, that the idea that the Second World War Army is, is a different prospect um, to the First World War Army because they're voters. And yeah, yeah. Uh, and yep. it's a completely different, literally a different constituency that the generals are dealing yeah. with. They're, they're dealing with people who live in constituencies all of a sudden, and, 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 and who who have a say. And yeah, yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. And generally, anyway, they're a more bolshy lot than their fathers and uncles and, 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 and elder brothers. In fact, the the amount of social change between 1918 and 1939, I think, is really underrated. That. On the surface, you've got the same sort of army trotting out in 1914 as in 1939. Actually, you haven't. I mean, they think differently. It's 20 years into a sort of democratic experiment. And, yeah, they're, and they're, they're not, they're not, not quite, quite as deferential, are they? They're not nearly as deferential. And, and one of the things which... Um, OK, so flying off the tangent here that I've been working on recently, is I think the British officers in... No, tangent away, we like that. On <laughs> the, the British officers in the First World War, I think, are very, very good at actually recognising what their men need in terms of paternal um, leadership. Officers of the Second World War, oddly, really they're not. And I think they're taken by surprise by how the, the nature of the soldiers they're being faced with, who after all are the sons of the blokes that you know the generals are commanding as commanders, captains and, and majors 20 years before, they actually have a really quite, quite a different uh, out, outlook on life. And again, this is all wrapped up to this idea of huge change, you know, ripping up in 1914, and, and they still haven't entirely reassembled the bits in the right order in 1939. Yeah, I mean, it, and the army, because the, the army are keenly aware of this, aren't they? The, uh, um, Adam is, uh, they're, they're, they're sensitive to this idea. You've also got, you've, but you've also got that thing where the generals think, well, I can't ask them to do the things we asked their fathers to do. They'll just say no. They'll, they'll, yeah. they'll, they're too bolshy. They'll, they'll tell us to get knotted. And you also, but then you also, and it's a thing in Letters Home an awful lot, especially in Normandy, you've got people saying, well, at least it's not as bad as it was for my dad on yeah. the Somme. I know things, I know things are bad here. You know, and, and, and when we talk, and we talked about Normandy a lot, about the, the meat grinder in Normandy that it descends into. And they're right, they're all saying to each other, well, it's not as bad as what my dad had to put up with. And, it, and, it, and it arguably, really, well, do you know what? I remember really clearly talking to this lovely chap called Peter Moore, who was in the Leicesters. Uh, and he, he fought in Tunisia and then he fought, uh, he was wounded at Salerno, came back and then fought in the Gothic line battles on the, uh, with Eighth Army on the, um, on the eastern side of Italy. Uh, and um, he, 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 shared with me this letter that he'd sent to his parents saying exactly that he said i'm reading and it was a line where he said i'm reading memoirs of an infantry officer at the moment by cv to to remind myself that how bad it is it wasn't as bad as it was in the western front and i said to him said to him exactly your point now i said actually it was worse and i said just think about it think about all the letters you've sent before you know uh my friend from school johnny i've just heard that he's died um phil has just died uh um bob didn't make it you know it's literally all his mates get killed uh, and actually, uh, yeah. I think uh, I had to be something like thirty-five combat veterans uh, of of, of the uh, Italian campaign, and of all those veterans, there was only one who hadn't been wounded, or you know, yeah. or, or badly so. Well, I, I mean, I, it was that, just that so. That's so right. I mean, the first thing I ever had published on the Second World War, well, first thing I'll own up to anyway, um, is uh, was a, a, <laughs> a chapter in a book called Paul Anderson Ang- Angus. Co- oh yes, 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 Time, yes, time, I've got time to Kill. Yes, Time, I've got time to Kill. I've got just up here. And uh, I did, did a chapter called The Shadow of the Somme, and I basically just made that argument that, that all these guys in the Second World War consoled themselves by, no matter how horrible it was. Yeah. that their dads had had it worse. So, well, actually, no. Normandy, Casino, Chindits. Yeah. Yeah. They had a really, really bad time. That's the yeah. one. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's it. Yeah. I'm, for, you um, can't see it, but I'm holding it up. Shadow of the Somme by G.D. Sheffield. It's when I still use my initials until I was told to start <laughs> using my first name because it's, it's more, more used. Oh, you'll thing. be pleased with that. You've got, you've, got a, you've got a tick there, Gary. 
Ah, you guys from Reddit. <laughs> <laughs> but but that, but that's so important because I because I think that the, the soldiers of the Second World War mythologized their dad's war to yep. make sense of their own one. Yeah. And I, 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 I think someone in that book made the point. I can't remember who who, who it was. It might be John Ellis actually. That particularly the um, the infantrymen. Yeah. They had you know considerably an even worse time. Than the Second World, the, the, the First World War predecessors, because the vast majority of British soldiers in the Second World War were on the lines of communications, mm. or they were doing something. And what, what are we talking about? Was it was it was it fifteen percent of all soldiers in Normandy were actually in rifle companies, and they took seventy five percent of casualties? Some, yes, some, uh, something I think like it's that. actually fourteen percent. Yeah, I mean, but, but that's interesting. That, that's the difference between the First World War and the Second World War is that the proportion of those who are really right at the sharp end is is much less. You know, so you know the makeup of of Second Army in Normandy is forty three percent in the service corps. We don't have anything like that number in the First World War. Yeah, you know, yeah. so so you know, I think it's only eight percent in in tanks. Whereas, you know, everything that we we write about, every you know, whether it be a commando comic, whether it be a film, um, you know, Saving Private Run, whether it be um, a narrative history, a documentary, all we focus on is the fourteen percent in the infantry and the eight percent in in tanks so it gives this impression that they make up kind of 90 percent of the army when actually they yeah. you know, collective they make up you know only only 22 percent and, and and it is a, it is very very distorting yeah i'm absolutely right it's not original thought and again i can't remember who, who said it but so you know why don't we have the our vision of the second world war um shaped by the same sort of things we have our vision of the first world war well because you don't get this mass of sort of really grim memoirs i mean you do get grim memoirs from the second world war but most people are writing about their war as being you know very different yeah um from you know the infantry, infantryman's experience and so yeah i mean um things like um uh martin Lindsay's so so few got 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 through or or, or mm. sydney jarry's 18 platoon yeah. they're not nearly as well known as they should be, uh, in comparison to, I guess, their First World War equivalents, because... Well, in the case of Sidney Jari, I mean, the, the reason is, is because he refused to publish it properly. He only, every, he only wanted to do it for raise money for his regiment, um, uh, which then became the, <laughs> you know, the, the um, Light Infantry Regiment in Dorchester. Uh, and he still refuses to have it published, anything other than self-published. I mean, you know, someone could get hold of that and turn that into an absolute classic. But, but you know, I've just been talking to Christopher about this. And, and you know, that was his father's dying wishes. And, and well, he yeah. well he, he I, I actually, knew, I actually knew, knew, knew Sidney relatively well because yeah. he would come along every turn to talk to the cadets at Sandhurst. Yeah, because he's so an like, absolute legend, over a few, few munches and all, what have you. And actually, that, that book, I think, has had an amazing impact on a couple of generations of army officers went through Sandhurst from the late eighties onwards. Yeah, 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 it has, but 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 it is literally because it's sort of taught as a set text at Sandhurst. Yeah, yeah, but it is not it is not widely known, and and for anyone who can get hold of a copy, I mean, I, I couldn't recommend it more highly. It's an absolutely brilliant, brilliant account. But it's interesting, you know, you go to Normandy, and I think that you know, if you add up all the all the casualties. And divide it by the days of the battle, the seventy-seven days. You get a figure of, if off the top of my head, it's like six thousand seven hundred and eighty, which is actually a higher daily casualty rate than the Somme, Passchendaele, or Verdun. But it's you know, but 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 the proportions of people at the coal face is obviously less than it was in the First World War. But if you're a frontline soldier in the Second World War, your chances of getting through unscathed are literally zip. Can I sort of drag this back to Thirty Years' War thing? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah, 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 exactly yeah. how we like to do uh, things. The Karen. point, the point is, I think that where where the Thirty Years' War does work as an idea is you see the Second World War um, in terms of, of tactics and very largely technology as well as being more of and better than fourteen eighteen rather than completely invented from 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 scratch. Yeah, right. and uh, and certainly, and, and I think it's really interesting because because uh, you you find f uh, Second World War vets, Sidney Jerry being one of them actually, being quite sniffy about First World War veterans. So of course, these these old farts, as far as they're concerned, you know, with these yeah, outdated yeah, yeah. methods. Actually, you look at what they're doing in 1918. It's not much different. It's not. It's not much difference. It really there isn't. But of well, course, also, they, they, they've got this. If you look at if you look at the battle plan for Alamein, I mean that that you know it's huge artillery barrage advance. I mean there's not really there's not not a lot of difference from 
So if you the, added the up the first award, but the difference is, of course, is they can all communicate with one another. A lot so if you added yeah, up, that, that's the big difference. So, so if you added up to to, to, to ten years in, in total fighting, you basically spend half of it fighting like the first three years, the First World War, and half <laughs> of it fighting uh, like the like the Second World War. If you if you want, because I mean that's what the French are. You know that this idea that the Germans fight World War Two, the French fight World War One at this in in May nineteen forty, that there's this sort of that the penny has dropped for some and not for others is is what, another part of the story, isn't it? That, that well, that's right, and uh, well, actually, actually, I think that, that that's a bit unfair on the French because yeah, the French is, yeah. thought really hard about the lessons of the First World War and came up with precisely the wrong ones. <laughs> if you if you actually look at the rationale behind you know the the conducted battle and all the rest of it for 19, uh, 1940... In nine, actually, not even 1918, in 1916 terms, it makes a certain amount of sense. But of course, they haven't really caught up with the broader thinking. The Germans, of course, on the other hand, of course, you know, get huge admiration for what they did. In fact, they also drew effectively, effectively the wrong lessons. They come together with, you know, debate this term blitzkrieg, which works when it works, but then basically, I think, is, 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 is a false form of warfare but, but, but Gary that's how the Germans called. have always fought I mean you know that's how Frederick yeah, the Great fights this idea that you you know because they're they're resource poor you know because they're stuck in the middle of Europe they've you know whatever battle they've got to be that they're going to fight has got to be fought quickly because otherwise they're going to be stuffed the moment it comes gets drawn out and, and attritional they're 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 in the doo-doo and and so that that's sort of as old as the hills for for the Prussians than the Germans. I mean, there's nothing new at all. It's just that in 1914 well, well, they get bogged abs- down, and and, and abs- ultimately, so they do in the Second World War too. Well, absolutely is. I mean, the the difference is that this time people take it seriously. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I mean, on on, on 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 the other side, I mean, um, you know, I've been listening to some of the stuff coming out about about Normandy re- recently, and of course, the British make again a really wrong decision in 1940, 41, 42. What the Germans have are lots and lots of tanks. That's the key to their success. Therefore, we need lots and lots and lots of tanks, which we end up with lots and lots of tanks and not enough infantry in 1944. And we haven't really worked out the correct way to use tanks. And, 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 and. So all, all of these things, I think, are... They're understandable spin-offs from the, the lessons of the First World War, which then lead on to what happened in, in the beginning of the Second World War. But it really takes, you know, some, you know wise if uh, very egocentric, head on the shoulders of, of Bernard Montgomery to come up with, I know, what, what we do at, at Alamein is go back to what I learned as a staff officer uh, in 1917 at the Battle of Messines. We'll have a nice sort of set piece offensive, lots lots of artillery. But Big Monty, of course, he would never own up to where he got his inspiration from. Uh, and again, in, ni- in ni- 1944, again, and of course, it, it, separately in the Mediterranean, in 40, 40, 42, 40, 43, 44, you, you have the British Army coming up with combined arms tactics, which are, which are really well known in 1918, but for all sorts of reasons been forgotten or at least neglected, and you have to put them all back together again. So, yeah, I think the Second World War, treating the First and Second World War as being two you know, linked conflicts in terms of technology and tactics and methods, I think make, make, makes a huge amount of sense. Uh, so this idea, of, I think, with 30 years war actually does work quite well in, in, in that respect. In that, re- in that regard. And then, of course, the advent of nuclear weapons just means that's, it's, it's all changed. That's all, that, that era has ended as well, that era of that form of total war, yes? Yeah, ab- think, absolutely. Um, yeah. I mean, no one who wasn't in the know about the Manhattan Project in July 1945 would have believed that they had just fought the last global conventional total war because yeah. they had had, you know, two within the space of 20 years. A third one was going to be clear on, on the cars at some point in the future. But, of course, what happens is the invention of nuclear weapons suddenly makes conventional warfare much too dangerous to yeah. contemplate, well, actually, of course, the Americans did contemplate it in in, in, in late forties, early fifties. Yeah. But realistically, it, it, it makes the whole thing far too dangerous. So therefore, it's not that warfare war ceases to exist. As some sort of you know quite optimistic thinkers thought in the late forties, it merely means that sort of war no longer exists. So therefore, you have things like Korea, which is pretty much a a Second World War, even First World War war being fought conventionally, but the war is not allowed to boil. So warfare does change. It basically it means that you never fight a 
never so far, I should say, fight <laughs> yes, a so global so... total war like the First or Second yeah. World and Wars it, again. It, and everything, everything, kind of since then, really has been asymmetric in its um in its prosecution, hasn't it? So it's it's it has. Yeah. And uh, also, weaponry's just become too sophisticated. Yeah, yeah, that that too. Yeah. So you, Korea, Vietnam, and and uh, Afghanistan, all the all the all the wars in Afghanistan tend to be superpower not picking on someone its own size because picking on someone someone your own size is just not worth the candle well just think about air power that's example. right yeah. i mean you know how many jets are there in europe at the moment well, let's say for argument say about 170 something like that so what happens once once you know so, so say so just say for argument's sake it, it's kind of you know nato countries against against russia you know what happens once those jets get knocked out of the sky i mean because they they uh, inevitably there will be some attrition i mean you, you, you can't build 296 a month or 496 a month can you you build you know one every six months yeah well i remember when i was uh, working for the army you know um back when i was teaching at santos in the 90s one of my students told me and i still don't know whether it's true or not it might have been a wind up they're very prone to winding up their lecturers that there were a load of the old you know the, the, the conqueror tanks from the 1960s those sort of yeah. goliath things in giant plastic bags in in store somewhere in an old railway tunnel near near Bath, I think it was told, which would be wheeled out once right. all the decent tanks have been destroyed on 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 the central front if the Soviets attacked. Um, so, so caused... we're with the RAF. You'll have to sort of you know unstrap the gate guardians and and fire them <laughs> up and, <laughs> and bring back the tornado. <laughs> I find that I find that entirely believable, to be honest. Um, <laughs> mothballed mothballed uh, tanks and so on. Um, Gary, this. Uh, the, 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 I mean, the, one of the interesting things, isn't it, it, it uh, uh, to, to go back to what we were originally trying to talk about, <laughs> is, that, is that, of course, um, uh, uh, a thing like the First World War, Second World War, as they, as they go further away in time, it's perhaps easier to, to, to you know, br- bracket them together, isn't it? Whereas when they're, up, when they're up close, it's the tumble of history of one thing happening after another. And it, is, it, is, it, is it the historian's temptation to say, oh, well, you know, um, we can, I, can, I, can, I can give this a label now and uh, explain them with, a, with, a, with, an, uh, with an overarching label? Because right at the start, you did say after, because after all, if, the, if German conservatives had found a different way of, uh, of um, uh, dealing with Hitler politically... It, none of, we wouldn't be we'd be talking about the first world war and then whatever happened in the 50s you know when the you know you know what i mean yeah 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 the, the, i do the, yeah. The, 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 I... The, so, so, so to go back to, to digress from my own point, is that is this is this not like a historianly a historian's temptation to sort of say, hi, here here's a thing because the echo with the Thirty Years' War is almost irre, is almost irresistible, or is it or or, or is it that is this actually how patterns emerge like like James said earlier? It's it's a bit of bit of bit of both things actually because certainly from the late eighteen nineties onwards there was. A sense of thing. it might have been at Moltke the Elder who made a comment that you know the next war that start will be a thirty years war because of the strength of the states involved and what have you. So there there was actually a sense running alongside the idea that the next war would be short, which actually I'm far from I've, I'm far from sure was was a universal um, belief among among uh, d- d- decision makers that actually you're letting yourself in for something really nasty if you let. You know, if you let the genie out of the bottle. The other thing, of course, is that historians, you're actually right, do like to sort of play around with stuff like this. I can't remember who said it, but said there's two sorts of historians. There's lumpers and splitters. The lumpers <laughs> like to put things together to form patterns. The splitters yeah. like to sort of clear them off to sort of fight, fight, find, clear, clear, blue, That's blue, a great water. line. <laughs> Are you a lumper um, or a splitter, Jim? <laughs> well, I don't know. I have to think about that. I think I'm a I think lumper, I'm a... actually. You think you're oh, a lumper? Well, there we go. Oh, we're, 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 we're nearly turning into, in, in, into an oompa lumper, which is not quite the same thing <laughs> at all. But, uh, yeah, I, I, but certainly I think if you're, in, if you're in the 1920s, to be told or at least hinted at that this might not be the end of it yeah. is really shopping. Colonel Reppington, who was, a, who was the um, military correspondent, first of all, the Times and the Morning Post, terrible reprobate um, and, uh, you know... Uh, all-round CAD. He published in 1920 
uh, two volumes of memoirs, which caused a scandal, not least because he was recounting, uh, sorry, sorry, diaries, not memoirs. He was recounting conversations he'd had with people only sort of 18 months before. Oh, I sat down with Winston. Winston said such and such. That's uh, uh, very shocking if you're involved. But the real reason why it caused a scandal was he called these memoirs the First World War. In 1920, he was implying there was going to be another one. And that was not a popular message No, in the 1920s. And, of course, for most of the interwar period, they didn't actually call it the First World War yeah. or World War I. It was the war, the Great War, well, yeah. the European War. There's, um, there was some... Uh, 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 piece by I think it's David Reynolds a few years ago who looked into the politics of what you call wars yeah and so so Churchill I seem to remember in, in the first volume of uh, his second world war volumes that the gathering storm makes a big thing about you know what do you call the war I call, I call it the unnecessary war because he's making point that he was right and Chamberlain was was was, was wrong of course but um, it's really only from the perspective of 1945 can people start to look back and put these things together and say yeah. and of course the, the immediate impact um ajp taylor i think i mentioned him and did, did finish the point but of course in the early 60s um he argues that hitler is a sort of i think calls him wicked but rational yes he's, he's yes he, that's exactly what he calls it D yeah he's, he's, he's wicked but rational he's sort of true and he fits the fits the kind of bill of what's going to happen and what and what, what opportunities he's given and it's all kind of I mean, it's, it's a, it was a scandalous um, uh, interpretation of events when he came out with it. And it was a scandalous interpretation of events, but it actually puts together the First and Second World War yeah. really nicely. Yeah. But of course, since then, I mean, two of, I think, the, 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 the best historians to deal with this are uh, uh, Sir Michael Howard, who was very sadly died last year, and Philip Bell, PMH Bell, who actually also died not, not that long ago. Around the same time in the mid-90s, they both made separately the same argument that actually, no, Hitler was a one-off. You know, yeah. he was such against the run of play that if Hitler had not had come along, you could easily have seen the First World War succeeded by a sort of peace broken by local wars, but nothing on the scale of yeah. the Second World War. Hitler made the difference. Yeah. And I think that really is where my... My, 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 my views lie on, on this idea of a 30 years war. Yeah, it works really well in some ways, but you mustn't see the Second World War as a direct consequence of the Treaty of Versailles. Right. Wonderful. Not well, a foregone conclusion. It's fascinating. No. no. Yeah. Thank you, Gary. Um, that, that, well, I mean, we, uh, we got... You know what we did there, James, for, which we rarely do, is we ended up back where we started. Which that's, is yeah, no, that's amazing, isn't it? So, well, <laughs> we amazing. should congratulate ourselves on that. Um, but that was, that was fascinating, Gary. And, Thank you um, so much, Gary. Yeah, and yeah, I, really, and, really and I let you get away with the kind of the British were crap and didn't work out how to use tanks. But maybe <laughs> no, we'll... no, 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 no. I did not say that. I said <laughs> elements of it were. No, 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 I know, I know. I'm only, I'm only joking. But, but maybe we can discuss that one another time. Can I just say, apropos, uh, I, I, I do not the Brit think the British Army in the Second World War was crap far from it. <laughs> I, know. I, share, okay. I share an office with Professor John Buckley, oh, yes. who would be... Wow. <laughs> kicking me out if he thought I believed well, that. Well, thank you, Gary. And, and can I just yeah, remind everyone again that we've got this um, the Chalk Valley History Show uh, on tonight um, with Al talking about his Spitfire bit um, and that, also Adam Rutherford bit, yeah. and living history and all sorts of things. So that is on, if you go to cvhf.org.uk, you can see that uh, live on uh, YouTube premiere at 7.30pm or thereafter tomorrow. Uh, and Gary, you're you're writing about Dominion, the Dominion soldiers in the Second World War, aren't you? Their experience. Of... Uh, yeah, um, I'm 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 writing a book called Civilian Soldiers: The Experience of British and Dominion Soldiers in Two World Wars. So I'm comparing Great. the First World and Second World War and the Brits with all the Dominions. So no pressure, nice small task. Where, yeah, yeah, exactly. We, when, where do you start? Jeepers. When, when can we expect that? When will that appear in my Kindle? I'm I'm hoping to get the the first draft finished by the end of the year. Uh, so I've I've got my teeth into it now and okay. uh, yeah well, wh when it's on its, progress. when it's up on its legs properly c uh, come and talk to us again please and we'd, uh, oh, we'd, we'd, we'd love to hear, yeah. hear your um, findings on that it'd be brilliant well um, thank you. a huge thank you to Gary Sheffield thanks everyone for listening uh, cheerio everybody I'm a splitter I'm not a lumper <laughs> <laughs> cheerio okay thank you bye. <laughs>